Добрый день, Миша. А вы слышите вообще? -то? Добрый день. Вы меня слышите? А, нет, я слышу. Слышите? Здравствуй, Здравствуй Миша. Добрый... Добрый день, Алексей Викторович. Извините, секунду, у меня тут что-то замерзло. Не двигаются слайды. Окей. Okay. Окей. Okay. Алексей Викторович, поздравляю вас с днем рождения. И мой доклад будет по-английски. Спасибо. Сергей, где Сергей? Я, в конце, я хочу начать с математики, а в конце там чуть-чуть про воспоминания и фотографии. Отлично, да. Пожалуйста. Да. Я сейчас вот вспоминаю, как мы ходили в Кусково. Почему же в первую очередь? Вспоминаете ли? Что, а, что? Алексей Викторович, там и ставим. So we are starting uh, the uh, meeting, and the, the next talk is by my Mikhail Fabian, autonomous robot motion and topology. Thank you, thank you very much, uh, Sergey, for. <laughs> thank you very much, Sergey, for uh, inviting me to speak. It's a really pleasure, and congratulations to Alexey Viktorovich for his uh, 85th birthday. It's great. Um, so my talk will be about um, autonomous robot motion and topology. And here is the plan of my talk. So first I will speak about what are robots and what are motion planning algorithms, uh, the notion of topological complexity, upper and lower bounds for TC. TC stands for topological complexity, uh, some calculations for spheres, surfaces, and projective spaces. And then um, I will speak about sequential topological complexity and uh, the conjecture, which we call rationality conjecture, and which is still open. Well, partially open, partially Well, there is some information about this conjecture, but it is still uh, open. Can you hear me? Is it okay? Yes, yes, we hear you. Okay. Okay, so let's start with uh, what are robots? Uh, what is the definition? You will send me the, uh, your text in English. Uh, yes, I can send it. Yes. So what are robots? I mean, it's, it's very interesting for, for me, but uh, I, I listen. Okay. So what is a robot? I mean, what is the definition of a robot? So here you can see one vacuum cleaner robot and um, humanoid robot, robot which can walk and has vision. Um, well, here you can see um, many drones flying together. You can think of them as being one single robot. So for me, actually, robot is um, a topological space. And I will explain what I mean by that. So in, in some sense, robot is a topological space. And um, this talk is about how to make robots to move autonomously. So you, so robot, like on this picture, robot is in some position and it needs to get to some other position, which is shown there on yellow dot. And uh, the robot itself must find this route to get from initial position to the final position. Um, But it, what is important here is that it's not from given A to given B. The robot should be able to get from any given A to any given B. So the robot must be able to uh, have this function from initial pair of states, initial state and final state, and the function associates to this pair 
a trajectory, a motion of, um, of the robot. And there, again, the robot can be not a single kind of um, moving uh, mechanism, but it can be um, a flock of drones flying together. I mean, from a mathematical point of view, it is the same. It is the same. So autonomous um, robot motion is a big area of robotics. And it um, the goal is that you give the robot um, an order expressed in one of the natural languages. And you can say, drive me to some campus of some university. And the robot must decide which way to go, which what is a suitable route. Uh, to get from uh, the initial position to the final position. Um, I think I already uh, mentioned this. So um, again, I want to emphasize that robot may mean any mechanical system, possibly having many independently moving parts. And examples are a self-driving car, several driverless cars moving in a coordinated way, a flock of drones flying in space, performing a military mission, a fleet involving multiple ships or submarines. So, I mean, this, let's say, configuration of submarines is a, is a state of one robot uh, in some sense. So a robot, um, a state of a robot is determined by a certain number of numerical parameters, some angles, some dimensions, some lengths parameters, and in a totality of all these parameters can be viewed as a vector or a point in some Euclidean space. And uh, the, uh, the space of all these configurations is called uh, the configuration space of the system. So it is a subset of some Euclidean space um, and it has topology induced from uh, this space. Um, I'll look at some examples. Um, well, it, it is a very, <laughs> it's a birthday talk, so it is. it should be very elementary. So this is why, I'm trying to make it very clear. Uh, so the first example is a wheel. I mean, the configuration space is, is one angle. So it is a circle, the circle, the configuration space. Another example, if you have a double pendulum, so there are two bars which can move independently of each other. So it's a product of two circles. It's a torus. Uh, here it's another example. Well, it's a, it's a kind of a spider. It's a linkage. Uh, three legs of this linkage are fixed on the plane. Uh, it has this, this uh, spider has uh, six legs. Well, three legs and three knees. So it has um, degree of freedom is two. It's actually two dimensional. But uh, the configuration space is a closed surface of genus 21. I will not uh, discuss this further. <laughs> um, well, this is a robot arm. So robot arm has a certain number of bars. Each can move independently. Uh, and if it is a planar case, then um, the configuration space is a product of uh, circles. So it's a torus. And if it is in three space, then the product, uh, then the configuration space is a product of two dimensional spheres. Okay, so here's another example. So here is a, a factory, big factory, and the floor of this factory has uh, railways, this um, square. Uh, uh, square latches uh, consist of uh, rail trucks and along these trucks uh, some vehicles move and um, this can be viewed as a one system 
And of course, the configuration space consists of positions of these vehicles uh, such that there is no uh, collision between them. So this is an important example. And this uh, is kind of a more general example that if we have a, a configuration space, we can consider, uh, uh, sorry, if we have a topological space, we can consider the configuration space of this uh, space X, which consists of all configurations. So let's say N points in the space, which are pairwise distinct. So this uh, case, uh, I mean, uh, is a configuration space. This space is a configuration space for flocks of drones flying in three space. Okay. So now, I mean, uh, up, up, until now, we just, just discussed uh, configuration spaces and examples of different um, systems. And now I want to discuss uh, uh, the motion planning problem. Uh, the motion planning problem from the geometric viewpoint. So we have X will be our configuration space of the system. So it is a path connected topological space. Points of the space represent states of the system. And um, we will also consider uh, X to the I. So this is a space of all continuous curves in X. So I is uh, interval zero one, and X to the I is a space uh, of all continuous curves in X, continuous maps from I to X. So they are motions of the system. And there is a map, there is a map P, which associates with every path the pair of points in X, which, which are the initial point and the final point. So this map P associates with every motion, the initial point and the final point. So what is a motion planning algorithm? A motion planning algorithm is actually a map which goes against P, it goes in the other direction it goes from X cross X to X to the R. So it takes um, pairs of states and it, it should associate to a path connecting these two points. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, yes, we hear you. Okay. So uh, a motion planning algorithm is a map which is called A, here is denoted by A. It, it goes from X cross X to X to the I. So the uh, uh, value of this map is a path. It's, an, uh, it's a curve in X. And it, uh, this curve must be such that it starts at little X and ends at Y. So in other words, a, this our map A algorithm is a section of this vibration P. So here we, we are kind of, we are in a situation where, which are very standard for topologists. Uh, we have a vibration and we want to find a section. And this section is this motion planning algorithm. Okay. <clears throat> So um, there is a lemma which says that a continuous motion, a, a continuous section exists if and only if uh, X is contractible. So for example, like in this case, if X is a convex set, then definitely such a section exists and it's given by just going straight from A to B, a long straight line, and it is a perfect section. Um, but if we have a non-contractible configuration space, then any motion planning algorithm is discontinuous. This means that whatever algorithm you suggest for the system, if the configuration space is not contractible, 
the algorithm will be uh, discontinuous, which means that there will be always a pair of points A, B, pair of initial finite configurations such that sufficiently, let's say, arbitrary close to A and arbitrary close to B, you can find points A prime, B prime, such that the algorithm gives totally different motion compared to um, the motion from A to B. And uh, this, um, my work is actually about how to measure, how to measure numerically these discontinuities and how bad these <laughs> discontinuities can be. Uh, so this is the kind of beginning of um, the story. So um, in order to um, uh, understand what's going on, we need to measure numerically these discontinuities. And this uh, invariant which uh, comes out of this is called TC of X. TC is abbreviation for topological complexity of X, TC of X. And it is defined as follows. So we have X is our path connected topological space, which is our configuration space of our robot. Um, and uh, this T of X is a minimal integer K such that X cross X admits uh, an open cover by K plus one open sets with the property that each of these sets admits a continuous section of that vibration. Okay, <clears throat> so if, if, if uh, X is contractible, then TC of X is zero. That's because you, you can take as uh, this open cover just one set, U zero equals X cross X. But um, if X is not contractible, uh, this doesn't exist. So you need to take more sets. Locally, it always exists because it's a vibration. So there is always exist section of a uh, local of a small sets. And um, it turns out that this TC of X is a number integer and it is a homotopy invariant of X. And it is zero if and only if X is contracted. So uh, topological complexity is a kind of level of uh, or degree of complexity of space. So zero is contractible. And then there are spaces of complexity one, complexity two, three, and so on. So um, an equivalent definition, um, uh, you see here in this definition, we use open sets covering X cross X. But equivalently, um, we, instead of this open sets, we can look at just partitions uh, with no requirements, no assumptions on the sets. So any, any partition uh, into K plus one sets uh, with the properties that each of the sets admits a continuous section. This is a kind of it's a theorem. Uh, it's not immediate, but it is true, assuming that X is uh, absolute neighborhood retract, which is always satisfied in, in practice. So if you look at the examples, um, so Sergey, uh, yes. can I, I mean, how uh, important is for me to finish it uh, at half past um, 11? Not, not not important. Is it okay? Uh, actually, I think it's 35, 14.35, uh, 35, but, but you can speak a bit more. Okay, I'll try to uh, be short, but maybe it cannot, it will come out a little bit. Um, so if uh, the first example is a circle, so in this case, um, uh, complexity is one. I mean, the circle is not contractible, so you can't um, 
do it with one set, but you can uh, cover it with two sets. Uh, so the first set F0 consists of pairs of not antipodal points. So then you can move from A to B along the shortest uh, geodesic arc. And then uh, the second set F1 is um, the set of all pairs of um, antipodal uh, points. And here you can uh, fix an orientation on the circle and move um, from A to B along uh, this orientation. So um, uh, in general, um, uh, if you look at spheres, topological complexity of spheres is one when n is odd and two is uh, when n is even. And I will not uh, go into the proof. Um, uh, let's just skip it. Um, okay. Uh, so in general, so this invariant TC of X is, um, is quite similar to lusternik schneelund category. It is related. It's a relative. <laughs> it's a close relative to the uh, lusternik schneelund category. But they are not equivalent, and I mean, um, they're related. So, um, uh, as category is difficult to compute, also it's not easy to compute the topological complexity. But um, in many cases, it is computable. And what we have are these general lower bounds and upper bounds. And playing with these upper bounds and lower bounds we can compute um, this TC in many examples. So this lower bound is based on uh, cohomology algebra. So it is, um, so we need to um, know how this, not only the uh, additive structure of cohomology, but uh, multiplicative structure as well. So we take um, some field coefficients and look at cup product in uh, cohomology, and we look at the um, element of uh, this tensor product, H uh, algebra to itself. So these are tensors. These are tensors. Uh, and we call such element a zero divisor if uh, once we replace this tensor product by cup product, the result will become zero. So these are called zero divisors. And examples of zero divisors are um, here on this slide. So for example, one tensor U minus U tensor one. So if you replace tensor product by cup product, it becomes um, zero because one times U minus U times one is zero. And uh, another product, another uh, tensor here is also a zero divisor. And it kind of, uh, um, it is skew commutativity of cohomology. Okay, so uh, the theorem says that if there are certain number, let's say K, zero divisors, such that the product is non-zero, then TC is at least K. So this is a lower bound and um, an upper bound is even simpler. This upper bound is um, twice dimension. So it's uh, very easy to, um, but I mean, combined with also uh, understanding that TC is a homotopy invariant. So if um, space has a homotopy type of uh, a space of lower dimensions, and you can put here a dimension of that lower dimensional space. Okay. Um, so this all is related to the notion of Schwarz genus of a vibration, which was introduced by Albert Schwartz in 1962. Um, <clears throat> Well, paper was published in 1962. So if we have a vibration, its genus, also known as sectional category, is a minimal integer k, such that the base 
can be covered by k plus one open sets with the properties that each set admits a continuous section. And Tc of x is a sectional category of this specific vibration, x to the i going to x times x. Um, so here are some examples for surfaces, uh, um, surface of genus zero, it is uh, S2, it's two, surface of genus one, it's torus, it's two, but surface of genus two and higher, uh, TC, the topological complexity is four. And this is another example when we look at um, uh, configuration space of N distinct particles in RD, then um, this topological complexity um, of this space is approximately 2N and uh, well, different uh, depending on uh, D is even or odd. And so this case, this was a joint uh, work with Mar Brandt and Sergei Yuzvinsky. And this is a robot arm. The configuration space um, is T4. Well, if there are four bars, then configuration space is T4. Then um, um, Tc of x to the n equals 4n. So this example, this 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 pre, this example and this example, they show that topological complexity can be arbitrarily high. It can be any number. It can be any number. Um, and this is um, another example: um, uh, real projective spaces. So. Um, the topological complexity of RPN uh, equals um, the smallest dimension um, of uh, Euclidean space to which um, this, uh, this RPN can be immersed. And for this is true for N not equal to 137 and for uh, N equals 137 uh, TC of RPN is N. So this is also joint result with Sergei Tabachnikov and Sergei Yuzvinsky. Two Sergeis. <laughs> um, and, and this is a table of uh, no, no, this values. So it's quite um, irregular, I mean, quite mysterious number. So actually this result, which I uh, just mentioned the theorem about uh, RPN. I mean, it's still uh, a little bit mysterious. And um, so here are two references. Um, the first is my paper uh, exactly 20 years ago. <laughs> and uh, the second is also 20 years ago, this paper with Tabachnikov and Yuzvinsky about projective spaces. So this is the first part of my talk. And, uh, and now I'm, I have still a few minutes left for the second part of my talk about sequential motion planning. Okay. So this uh, was um, uh, uh, introduced by Yuli Rujak in uh, 2010. And this is a kind of generalization of uh, what was before. So in this case, we uh, have a robot and our requirement is that it, it not only needs to go from A to B, but it needs to visit certain number of states in certain order. Uh, for example, here is a map of London and the robot should start at the Royal Court of Justice and then move to Museum of London then go to Smithfield Market and then get to Whitechapel Gallery. So, I mean, there is sequence of states and our robot must be, must move from A1 to A2, from A2 to A3, from A3 to A4 and so on. This is called sequential motion planning. And this um, can be formalized uh, uh, as follows. So we have our system 
uh, our system at which has configuration space X. So the points of this space X are states of our system. And we have time interval zero one. And in this time interval, we have fixed moments of time T1, which is zero, and then T2, T3, T4, TR. TR is one, it's end of motion. Uh, and uh, we consider the vibration uh, PR, which goes from X to the I to X to the R, which is just evaluation map at those points. So this is just evaluation map. So we look at curves and evaluate their positions at R fixed points in time. This is a vibration and um, the, se the sequential motion planning is a section of this vibration. So we can also define TCR, uh, the complexity of TCR of X. It, can, uh, it is defined as a Schwarz genus of this vibration. So it is, again, it is a minimal integer such that um, we can cover X to the R um, by uh, K plus one open sets uh, such that each of them admits a section. And again, here, instead of um, open sets, we can look at uh, arbitrary partitions of X to the R into uh, uh, subsets uh, with the property that each of these subsets admits a continuous section. Okay, um, yes, yeah, so it is also a homotopy invariant, TCR, and for the spheres, it, uh, TCR of SN equals N minus one if N is odd and R if N is even. Well, there are many more examples. I will not, um, I will not um, list uh, uh, many of them. Well, this is for surfaces. You can see um, for genus um, greater or equal than two, uh, TCR of surface is twice, uh, it is dimension times R. So two times R, dimension times R. Okay, so now, I, I mean, now I come to the, my uh, kind of concluding part of my talk. And, and a little bit mysterious, mysterious in the sense that there is an open question here um, about this rationality conjecture. So the question, how does this TCR depend on R? What happens when R is large? So to understand this, what we do, we kind of put all this TCR as coefficients in a formal power series. So it's a formal power series depending on X on our space. We call it, um, it's a joint work with John O'Prea. We call it TC generating function. So qu question, what kind of function is that? So this conjecture, which we call rationality conjecture, that if X is a finite, TW complex, then this uh, TC generating function is a rational function of a very special form. So it has denominator one minus T square and numerator is an integer polynomial and the value of this polynomial at one equals the category of X. Well, to me, this, <laughs> this statement looks amazing because this would connect all this um, invariance into one kind of um, picture. And category will also play a role here because you see in TC generating functions, there is no category. It starts from TC2. TC2 is the usual TC. Okay, so I'll, I'll just um, show you. I'm a bit over time. I'm, I will finish in a few minutes. 
Uh, I'll just show you some examples when it is true. For example, if we take spheres, let's say odd dimensional sphere, and we put all these numbers into this TC generating function, we see that um, it, is, um, it is a rational function of this type. The principal residue, well, it has pole of degree two at one, and the residue at this uh, in this pool equals category. Also, if you take the sphere of even dimension, well, it's a different function, but again, this um, um, it has pole of degree two at one, and the value, the residue at this pole is the category. The surfaces which I mentioned earlier. It, it, it is also true, the category is two, and um, this function is rational with this pole at one uh, degree two. <coughs> if X is a UN, unitary group, still true. There are more, much more examples when it is true. I will not list um, all of them, but I want to mention this, that if we can define TCR for a group, for a discrete group, by looking at Islander maclean space KG1 and taking TCR of that space. So this is, um, uh, these are uh, invariant topological complexity of a spherical space. So we tried many groups uh, and uh, in particular with John O'Prea, we proved that um, rationality conjecture is true for right angled arting groups where this TCR can be computed explicitly. Um, a theorem of Dronishnikov and Kevin Lee states that for hyperbolic groups distinct from Z, uh, from non commutative hyperbolic groups, um, uh, this, uh, TCR equals R times cohomological dimension of the group, and hence the rationality conjecture holds. Okay. However, uh, well, in this slide, we can see that in, in general, uh, we understood that um, this conjecture is not true in general. And this in the paper with Kishimoto and Stanley, we found an example when, um, when actually this uh, form of power series is the rational function of this form. It has um, a, a denominator exactly like uh, 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 predicted by the conjecture, but this residue uh, at, um, at pole um, is not the category. So this example, uh, this is a specific complex which violates the Ganea conjecture. So in this complex, um, this conjecture is not true. However, what um, is, um, so what we did, we modified this uh, rationality conjecture. So we, I call it weak rationality conjecture. And it says that uh, if X is a finite CW complex, then this TC generating function has this form as predicted, and this uh, numerator is an integer polynomial, and the value at one is less or equal than category, not equal, but less or equal. And in this form, the conjecture is still open, and it would be very interesting to <laughs> to see uh, further developments in this um, direction. So this, after this, um, I want to um, say a few words about Alexey Viktorovich. Uh, are you there, Alexey Viktorovich? Yes, yes. Okay. So I, I want to show a few photographs <laughs> from old times. Uh, Alexey Viktorovich and Vala. I think it was in uh, Kotsevelli somewhere, um, very young. Uh, how old were you then? Maybe below 40, below 40. 
Here is another photograph. Uh, uh, this, so, sorry? Uh, uh, I cannot uh, remember the place uh, where it was. Not in Baku. Не знаю. <laughs> well, this is uh, Matveev, Sergei Matveev, um, in uh, Black Sea. Uh, uh, and Sergei is not there, right? Sergei is not here. <laughs> so this is Sergei Matveev and me uh, in Katsuveli, I think. This, yeah, Katsuveli. This was in Katsuveli. And this is um, Sergei Matveev and Luba and me. So and, long ago. Yeah, it, it was in um, Ipetri. Yeah, we, we, we went on top of uh, this mountain, Ipetri. Uh, this is Dranishnikov. Here you, you were very like to him to yourself, but now you are not <laughs> like. <laughs> To my image of you, you are very, very, very strong, strong changing. Yes. Okay. Well, what can more, I say? <laughs> more solid. And uh, it is interesting. You, 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 um, Send, send me your paper here. Yes. Yes, sir. On this thing, on the um, planning of tra trajectory. By, uh, uh, no, uh, I will not uh, uh, add now uh, any things because time is over. Yes. Okay. But I. I will wait. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Ukraine. Thank you. Uh, so, any questions? Yes. Short questions. Yes, I have a question. Can I ask? Short, yes. My question is about Mikhail Sergei Sergei theorem. Uh, you have a connection about the uh, uh, C, uh, C2 uh, topological complexity and smallest uh, dimension of immersion. This is for uh, projective real space. Are there yes. some other example instead of projective space, real projective space, we have some other manifold and just uh, the same result, analog analogous to, to this uh, result of this theory, or this is the only example? Well, um, well, like, uh, as far as I know, this is only example. For example, for complex projective spaces, the answer is quite simple. And um, yes, uh, but also what I can tell you is that um, there is a, a variation of this notion, uh, TC, uh, it's called symmetric TC. So the symmetric TC, um, it, uh, they proved um, uh, Gonzalez and um, Landweber. They proved the theorem that the symmetric TC equals minimal embedding dimension of real projective spaces. Mm -hmm. So for for um, for the symmetric TC uh, 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 embedding dimension is. Um, is the answer. Uh, I don't know other examples where immersions are related to um, TC, to motion planning, but actually the connection is quite simple uh, in, um, in our paper. It's quite straightforward. Uh, in one direction, it is quite simple. If uh, existence, the existence of an immersion produces a motion planning algorithm for projective spaces, but the other direction is more um, difficult. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. 
I, I would like to ask a question. So is there a philosophical reason for this weak conjecture, why it should be true? Uh, for me, it sounds a little bit, you had this conjecture, you found a counterexample, and you, you take the closest where you have no counterexample. And this is the weak conjecture in my eyes. I'm, I hear this for the first time. And I always wonder, are there philosophical reasons why this conjecture is true, or is it just somehow that it is also for you completely open? Could be true, could be wrong. Well, um, <laughs> um, thank you for your question. Thank you. Um, but what is uh, interesting that we know many, many examples when it is true. Mm -hmm. It is true in, in, uh, in the strongest form, in the initial form. And this example, which violates, it is a kind of very unusual example. It is also violates this Ghanaian conjecture. So it was found for some other reason earlier by um, Don Stanley uh, to, uh, as an example violating the Ghanaian conjecture. Um, well, you maybe you are right. I mean, I don't know if there is philosophical reason. Uh, well, I mean, we don't know. I mean, <laughs> I mean, this is honest answer. I mean, who knows? But what is important that it is true uh, in many, many examples. Maybe you need to restrict to some class of spaces where it is true. Uh, I don't know. Yeah, this is my, my second question, which you answered it already. So uh, the original question looks to me very nice. And I would like to ask the question which you just mentioned, namely, restrict the spaces uh, in a natural way. So my question is, do you have any idea of a natural restriction so that the conjecture uh, in this, for me, more natural form than the uh, we conjecture uh, holds? So what could be the, the class of spaces where it holds? Yes, um, I can tell you. I mean, um, um, the class of a spherical spaces, K, ah. K pi one spaces of type K pi one. For example, we know that it is true for all hyperbolic groups, and for all right angle acting groups. These two classes already kind of um, uh, cover quite a lot of um, uh, groups. <laughs> so yeah, yeah. Okay. Left, of course, a, a Gromov type uh, yes. answer, namely a statement for all groups yes. is either trivial or wrong. <laughs> <laughs> so either you have some obvious reason why I told for all groups. We don't know all groups. It's so terrible. Yeah, well, Ishi Gromov uh, 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 proved that um, uh, hyperbolic groups are uh, typical. I mean, yes. They are, but he's, it still he says, for example, the Novikov conjecture, yeah. probably wrong because of no reason to hold for all groups. Of course, enough, yeah. Enough, well, enough question. I like last remark. I like your talk very much. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Martin. Okay, let's thank the speaker again. It's time for the next talk, but uh, let me ask uh, Alexei Viktorovich if we can hear two more talks without a break. It's your task. No, no. No, we didn't so we have only one question, but I will ask a question, but, but I'm uh, not sure in my English. No. But, uh, to, um, did you think about uh, union by accident, the trajectory? trajectory? You see, there are some uh, the work elements which are more or less uh, prepared to unite. But in this situation, uh, it, um, 
Uh, and I preparation. Uh, and uh, the trajectory is uh, uh, worked by uh, excellent, not 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 just just by uh, algorithm. Yeah. Do you think about such a? Yes. So yes, uh, Alexey Viktorovich, I um, in my first uh, papers, I. Uh, I looked at random motion planning algorithms. So when trajectory is random, is selected at random. And um, uh, also in this situation, uh, this TC, this complexity comes up as a number of um, possible choices of uh, random trajectory. So in, in, yes, so the answer is yes. Um, I looked at random algorithms, and then there is still um, a notion of complexity of such algorithms, uh, which is actually equal to this TC of X. So this comes in. Yeah. Possible. Possible way later. Thank you. Okay. Okay, so, so I think we, we, we have no, no, no time for more questions. It's time for the next talk.